Welcome to the Joseph Goldstein Insight Hour. This podcast is an expression of our shared interest in self-discovery. Join Joseph as he shares his deep knowledge of the path of mindfulness. If you are interested in supporting this podcast, please go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Joseph. thought we would start with a 15-minute or so sitting, just meditating with child guide a little bit. I'm just curious, is there anybody who has not done... Um, any kind of mindfulness type practice? Okay. <laughs> it's the mantra, mindful, mindful, mindful. <laughs> so take a, take a comfortable seat, as comfortable as possible, uh, but in a somewhat dignified posture, so you're not kind of slumping over. But not being stiff or tense, just in a relaxed way, but in some posture that supports the alertness. I'd like to start in a slightly different way than we usually do uh, in teaching mindfulness practice. Very often, very commonly, we start with attending to the breath you know, and just settling into the natural breathing process. Uh, but sometimes, as people try to do that, um, for some people, it can feel... Um, maybe there's a little forcing involved or uh, just tension in that narrowing, uh, which does fall away. It's very possible to be with the breath in a relaxed way. But I found there's another starting place, which I found both for myself and in teaching many, many people, uh, gotten a lot of feedback that it's a very helpful way of beginning. And it comes from, the basic instruction comes from the Buddha's discourse on mindfulness. So it's right out of the texts. And there's just one line in this uh, somewhat long discourse And the one line says, be mindful. And then it's the equivalent of, in quotes, be mindful, quote, there is a body, unquote, to the extent necessary for clear knowing and continuous mindfulness. So just that phrase, there is a body, we use that as the starting point because it doesn't take much effort. It's just to sit. And you might now settle into your posture, if you like, gently close your eyes, although it is also possible to sit with the eyes slightly open, if you're used to that. So just sit, relax into the body. And using the phrase uh, periodically, it's not, it's not a mantra, it's really just a reminder, there is a body. There is a body. And so we're taking the whole body as the frame of our experience. Just sit. Know you're sitting. Drop the phrase in from time to time. There is a body. So you're connecting with the feeling of the whole body. So it doesn't take much effort. It's really about relaxing, about settling back, being grounded in the framework. There is a body. Just get a sense of the effortlessness of that. Nothing much to do. And then within that framework, there is a body. You may become aware 
of the sensations of the body breathing. But instead of zeroing in on the breath, or instead of narrowing the attention on the breath, keep the larger frame, there is a body. And simply be aware of those sensations of the body breathing arising within that larger frame. So it's all very natural. And within the frame, there is a body. You'll notice that the body is breathing itself. You don't have to force it. You don't even have to particularly look for it. And occasionally repeat the phrase, there is a body, just as a reminder to settle back into that more open framework. And then become aware of whatever is arising within the framework. the sensations of the body breathing. You might become aware of the experience of hearing within the framework there is a body. Simply let the sounds be there. You might be aware of the sensations of the body breathing within the larger framework. And notice if you have some sense of wanting something, wanting the next breath, wanting it to be a certain way. And then simply settle back, there is a body, nothing to want. Within that framework, there is a body. You might naturally become aware of different sounds of hearing of the body breathing. Perhaps different bodily sensations arise apart from the breath within that same open framework. Simply let those sensations appear and change and disappear. And within that grounding framework, there is a body. You might become aware of thoughts appearing in the mind or images. Simply be aware of thinking or seeing as the thought or image arises. Don't be bothered by your thoughts. Simply let them come and go.
Sometimes we're not aware when a thought appears and it carries us away on a train of association. As soon as you become aware that you've been lost in a thought, carried away, simply recognize thinking and come back to the grounding of there is a body that becomes the anchor. You might become aware of the sensation of warmth, feeling warm, or the sensation of the breeze from the fans, touching the skin, Just different experiences arising within that framework, there is a body. And include within this field of awareness the different mind states or emotions that may be there. You can check the mind out. Is it calm or agitated? Is it interested? Is it bored? Is it alert? Is it sleepy? Simply noticing without judgment. The mind is like this right now. Whenever you might feel disconnected from your experience, Simply come back to there is a body, relaxed, simple, open, nothing to do. And then moment after moment, being aware of whatever arises within that framework. Sensations of the breath, other sensations, thoughts, different mind states, sounds. And the great gift of mindfulness is that in doing nothing, we can become aware of everything. So uh, uh, I want Joseph to tell you the story, but first I'm going to tell another story because um, his story is one of my favorite stories since it tangentially involves me. Um, but there's something about generosity as a practice that uh, has always been striking for me because it is both an internal and an external practice. And as I look around the room, um, there's some kind of dazzling looking Buddha things over there that look like they're having a really good time, but uh, they're not typical, actually. Um, what is, I like that third eye one over there. I don't know what he's got going, but uh, it looks intense. Um, <laughs> but a very classic image of the Buddha uh, is the Buddha actually before his enlightenment uh, when he was known as a bodhisattva or, or being aiming toward enlightenment, 
He's sitting under the Bodhi tree in Bodh Gaya, and he has his hand over his knee. So there's a very classic image, and what it depicts is, is the Buddha as Bodhisattva before his enlightenment, having sat down under this tree with a tremendous aspiration to be free and being attacked by this legendary figure known as Mara, it's sort of the satanic figure in Buddhism. And Mara wants the, the Buddha, uh, the Bodhisattva, to get up, to give up his aspiration, to feel defeated. And so he tries to tempt him away from that seat with um, very sensual images and frightening sounds and just a succession of challenges. And throughout them all, it said the Bodhisattva sat there serene. And then the last attack of Mara is more or less the attack of self-doubt, where Mara kind of says, who do you think you are? Like, who do you think you are to even imagine, dare to imagine you can be free? You can experience unconditional love. You can experience that kind of immense wisdom and clarity. And in response, it said the Bodhisattva reaches his hand, over his knee and touches the earth. And he asked the earth itself to bear witness to the many lifetimes, as the legend would have it, the many lifetimes in which he had practiced qualities like generosity and morality and truthfulness and resolve. And it was almost like the moral force that swept him up to that moment with the right to be there, to be in that seat. And Mara seeing that the earth shook in response to the Bodhisattva's gesture and fled into the night. And so the Bodhisattva sat through the night and was enlightened at dawn, the appearance of the first morning star. And so here we are, you know, 2,600 years later. Um, but it's always been very striking to me both, uh, yes, I have the right to be here, I have the right to have that big an aspiration, not to have a very blunted sense of what's possible in my life, like maybe, you know, a little bit better or, you know, kind of compromised or mediocre, but that immense an aspiration. And that it was certain practices that gave him not just the sort of empty dream, but the very real possibility of actualizing that, that aspiration. One of them being generosity. So the earth shook, Mara fled into the night, the Bodhisattva was enlightened at dawn. And the practices that he was asking the earth to bear witness to were both inner practices and outer practices. They're seamless, right? Because our lives are all of one piece. It's not that spirituality is an activity that we undertake once a week or, you know, once a day even, but it's all of our lives and what, how we speak to one another, how we relate to one another, how we relate to our own thoughts. How do we relate to our wandering mind? How many, I would love to know how many places we all went to in this last sitting, which was 15 minutes. Anybody go to Asia? Me? <laughs> you know, anybody else? You know, where'd you go? Right? Our attention tends to wander. How do we treat ourselves? How much generosity of the spirit is there in that moment? Right? So we practice it within. Every time we yield, we let go. Uh, we renounce in a way. That's an act of generosity. Every time we offer, we pay attention to somebody we care. That's an act of generosity. Every time there's material generosity, um, it's of course the same thing. And so it's an inner and an outer practice. And what we do within affects how we live. What we do in our lives affects how we are within. It's almost like it's a certain muscle group that we're, we're strengthening and wherever it's manifesting, uh, it can come, it can come alive. So generosity. Um, everything when we, when we talk about a quality like that is actually really based on awareness. And the healing and the transformation comes from being able to pay attention and see for ourselves what is true. Um, this is mindfulness. You know, many people these days and kind of like the popularization of mindfulness would say that we practice mindfulness to really fully inhabit our lives, to live fully, to actually, you know, maybe we're drinking a cup of tea and we're not multitasking for once. You know, we're actually tasting the tea rather than drinking the tea while we're checking our email, while we're on a conference call, 
while we have the TV on mute and we're reading the crawl, you know. Um, it's not a very fulfilling cup of tea. And so we just drink the tea sometimes. And that's, that's what mindfulness can give us and really enrich our lives in that way. But the original kind of design of the mindful practices, that was great. And that was a wonderful effect. But the real effect was not just to inhabit our lives, but to understand our lives, to have wisdom, to have insight so that we could see for ourselves because we're taught so many things about life, about strength, about aloneness, about what makes us happy, about what brings us down. And we have the opportunity, it's like we are our own lab, you know, to see for ourselves. And like one of the uh, craziest sayings we have, which happens to be a very strong conditioning for a lot of people is, um, it's a dog eat dog world. Isn't that crazy? Like I've had people say to me, well, dogs don't eat dogs. Then I've had other people say, well, dogs do eat dogs. Like, so I don't know which it is. Uh, <laughs> But anyway, what a terrible idea, you know, like, you know, subtext, live your life, don't help anybody because they're not going to help you. And you're on your own, doesn't matter what you have to do to get ahead, you'll only be safe when you you feel that kind of isolation and, you know, strength without counting on anybody. And I once sort of semi-ruined this young woman's life, I was co-teaching this six-day retreat, and the first night I was talking about what a strange phrase that is. And she came up to me and uh, to the microphone and she said, I never knew that the phrase was, it's a dog eat dog world. I always thought the phrase was, it's a doggy dog world. <laughs> like D O G G Y D O G, like puppies jumping up and down in meadows, you know? And I said, what a horrible phrase. And and then six days went by and it was a closing circle and she came up to the microphone and she said, I've decided I refuse to live in a dog eat dog world. I'm going to live in a dog eat dog world. <laughs> you know, but what are we taught? And, you know, how much have we absorbed? What do you really believe about generosity? You know, plenty of people are taught, well, that's for suckers or, you know, like, you know, be careful, make, make it more of an exchange, you know, don't. Um, and so we get to see for ourselves from paying attention. So one of the things we sometimes do at a place like the Insight Meditation Society, where there's like a resident community, is we play. You know, we undertake various disciplines, you could say, for a limited period of time, paying attention the whole while. You know, is this really making me happy? Is this bringing me down? What's the consequence of this? So Generosity is one of them where we say, and again, you know, we practice a lot with material generosity because it's that much more concrete and it's a great learning ground for other kinds of generosity. So one of the things we, we've sometimes done is take a resolve, let's say, I don't know, for a month, something like that, or two weeks, that when a strong thought of giving something arises in your mind, not just like a little dwippy thought, like a powerful thought, and it won't harm anybody. It's like, this will only make sense to a certain number of you, but I always say, never give away your rent control department <laughs> for you New Yorkers. You know, so if you have a strong thought to give something and it won't harm anybody, give it. And watch the whole while. Give it even though the next 50 thoughts after the intention to give might be frightened. I don't know. I've carried that book through four moves already. It's close to the top of the pile. Probably it's the only book I ever need to read again. I'll be fully enlightened by the time I close it, but I shouldn't give it away because really, you know, maybe it's the one, right? Give it anyway. Watch what it feels like when you have that impulse to share, to offer, to give. Watch what it feels like when you withdraw, when you hesitate, when you're scared. Watch, watch what it's like when you actually make the offering. And then watch later. Do you ever actually regret it? You know, so this is our opportunity to see for ourselves. Uh, do we trust that value? And when is it, you know, coming from a weird place, a strange intention, um, not a, a kind of freely given gift? You know, we look at our own motives and our, our intentions behind, behind the action. Like, where am I coming from? What do I want? Um, and it's all in the, it's all for the sake of learning, you know, so that we can see for ourselves. So there's not, 
any kind of judgment involved. And I would really urge you to consider that. It's, it's quite a lot of fun. Uh, our friend Bob Thurman did something. This is not exactly right, but it's close. He made a resolve. He said once he was, he uh, just retired from Columbia University. Uh, but he's been working there all these low, these many years. And he'd walk to work from, uh, uptown in Manhattan. And there were many, many people on the street asking for money. So he made a resolve that for a certain period of time, he was just going to stuff his pocket with like dollar bills and he was going to give money to anybody that asked. Not sort of like, oh, you're not going to use it well or, you know, you're better off doing this or whatever. And he would just give it. And he said one day he mistakenly like put a $50 bill in his pocket and he handed it to this guy who was ecstatic, of course. And he had this moment like, can I take it back? <laughs> you know, um, but she didn't. But that's why it's fun. It's like you get to see every reaction you have uh, and understand where where your happiness actually does lie. Uh, <clears throat> so I'll just share that story that Sharon mentioned, but then I'd like to follow up with a little PS to this last instruction or suggestion. Uh, so this goes back many, many years when I was... Uh, more at the beginning of this practice of generosity. But a little back, background to this is understanding that among Dharma teachers, a good story is gold. <laughs> and there's sometimes very aggressive behavior about holding on to a story. <laughs> okay, that's the background. <laughs> So I was on retreat, I was sitting myself, and this particular discourse of the Buddha came to mind, there was a story in it, and I thought, Sharon was writing a book at the time, one for many, uh, and I thought, oh, that would be a great story for Sharon's book. So that was my first thought. And then my second thought was, no, I really want to keep this story for myself, this is a good story. And then the third thought was, no, I, sh I should really just give her the story. But I'll let her know what I'm going through. <laughs> yeah, so to engender a little thankfulness. <laughs> and my mind just, is just, I'm abbreviating the train of thought here. But finally I said, just... <laughs> give the story. And what allowed me to get to that place was to reflect back to the first impulse. Because I was questioning myself, well, where's the purity in this? You know, I'm having all of these second thoughts and should I, shouldn't I? And so is there any purity in this, in this giving? And I realized there was in the very first thought. You know, it came, the impulse was there, just give. And so based on that, I suggested the story to her. She didn't even want it. <laughs> so that leads me a little bit into uh, a follow-up to the practice she recommended, because I've also been practicing in that way a lot, but tweaked it a little bit. And maybe it, maybe it will take some time of practice to get to this place, but... I have found it to be one of the most eye-opening and enriching and heart-expanding practices that I've been doing over these last years. And that is similar to what Sharon suggested, that if a thought arises to give something, I've taken the commitment just to do it. Just to do it. And it doesn't, in the way I'm practicing this, it doesn't have to be a strong thought. It could be just a passing thought. You know, just something comes to mind, you see a need in some situation, or it just comes spontaneously. You know, you feel love for somebody and you want to give something. So as soon as I recognize a thought to give, I really try to make my practice to do it. Now, in... In this way of practice, there has been a huge range 
of what I think to offer. So it could be something really small, just a gesture of friendliness or a gesture of kindness or something on a very simple level. Sometimes I've had the thought, and I'm not looking for these thoughts, and I'm not even looking particularly for the opportunities. It's just what comes to my mind spontaneously. So sometimes what comes to mind feels really big, way beyond what conventional society would think is appropriate. You know, just psh. So I've had a couple of those kind of thoughts, and my first reaction, as Sharon indicated, whoa, <laughs> yeah, this, is, this is something really big. But because I've undertaken the practice, I've done it anyway. And the amazing thing is that I have never regretted, ever. It always brings delight. So there's a little mantra that I created, but given what Sharon said, there may have to be an exception or two to it. <laughs> but the, the, the basic little mantra is, in the practice of generosity, there's nothing too small and nothing too big. Maybe except a rent-controlled apartment in New York. <laughs> but maybe even that. But sometimes we limit ourselves by some preconception of what society thinks is appropriate. But I have found that to be an artificial limitation. So again, this is a practice, it's an experiment. You know, you can each do it in your own way and come to your own decision about what the range is for you. But I would suggest on both ends, extending the limit. Nothing too small and nothing too big. And then see what happens. And it's so joyful. You know, the Buddha often um, began his teachings. He called it the graduated teachings. He would almost always begin it with the practice of generosity because it brings so much happiness. <laughs> You know, it's not, it's not like you have to practice for 20 years and maybe you'll follow two breaths in a row. No. It's like in the moment of giving, in the moment of generosity, the heart feels a happiness, a joy. So it's just a great practice. So we want to, we want to continue in discussing how generosity actually informs or is the essence of many other, we could say, wholesome or spiritual or heart-based qualities. Can I just say one thing? Yeah. Because uh, when you started speaking and I looked over at so Krishnadas, I remembered I have a whole other different jacket story <laughs> than Mirabai's. Where Mirabai started talking last night, I thought, oh, I know how this ends, and it was not the same ending. Because a whole different person, Surya Das, told me the story about admiring Krishna Das's jacket, and Krishna Das took it off and gave it to him. And Surya Das said something like, You can't do that. And Krishna Das said, The world is full of jackets. <laughs> And I thought, does he have a closet? <laughs> like last night, I thought, does he have like the, no. now he does. But then we were teaching together somewhere and, and one of us told the story, probably me, because he wouldn't tell it. And, and somebody called out, I really like your shirt, Krishna Das. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, get one of your own. <laughs> Something like that. But he seems to have a kind of bountiful sense of jackets. And I thought, well, the world is full of jackets. That's a worldview too, right? rather than so much lack and deprivation. <laughs> okay, so one of, one of the expressions of generosity that is just fundamental to a spiritual path, but fundamental to bringing about some harmony in our world uh, is the practice of um, 
ethical behavior. You know, and in Buddha, each, each tradition has its own formulation of this. But in the Buddhist tradition, it's often talked about in terms of the five precepts, you know, of not killing and not stealing and refraining from sexual misconduct and lying and not taking intoxicants, clouding the mind, just creating confusion. So just basic, basic principles of non-harming. And so one might think, well, how is generosity connected to this? But when we are committed to the ethics of non-harming in our speech, in our actions, what we're doing is offering the gift of fearlessness to everybody we meet. Because we're saying with our lives, with our behavior, with how we act, there's nothing I will do that you need fear. What a gift that would be in the world. You know, if, even if in the world we followed one precept, just imagine what the world would be like if we just took the precept not to kill and everybody followed that. It would be a very different world, you know? Or not to lie, not to shade the truth. So this is a tremendous power and it's a tremendous gift. And if we can understand that, the generosity aspect of it, it actually gives a further motivation for us to practice it, for us to commit to it. Um, this is another one of those moments. It was here and here, and then somehow <laughs> it got to here without going through. <laughs> but maybe it'll come back. <laughs> okay. I think one of the... Um, great understandings we come to uh, just through paying attention, uh, or you could say mindfulness or introspection or awareness, um, is how kind of breaking a harmony and acting in a way that um, is reckless in some fashion has consequences within ourselves. And whether the consequences are obvious outside of ourselves or not, they really do resonate within. So I thought of a rent control department story <laughs> where not exactly a rent control department, but a reasonable price department in New York City where um, this was in, I think it was in my last book and is one of those, uh, I always allow people who are going to appear in my book to change the name if they want. So this is like a heavily disguised story and it always takes me a while to think, how did I tell it? Um, but basically this this person told me that he was offered an apartment in the neighborhood he really craved being in, in the building he longed to be in, uh, that was larger than where he'd lived before and was a reasonable rent. So this is like a dream, right? You know, and, uh, through a whole series of conversations in talking to the owner, he realized it was actually an illegal sublet. So what an illegal sublet means is that, um, if a building is a cooperative, uh, the rules that govern the use of the apartment and how often you can rent it out and things like that are not made by you. They're made by the board of directors. Um, so you actually don't own your unit. You own a percentage of the whole. So they decide, you know, you can only rent it out for a year maybe. And then you have to live in it for three years before you can rent it out again or whatever, whatever they want. So those rules are usually crazy. So um, he was... The woman actually who renting it wouldn't actually say it was illegal, but she basically said, tell them you're my cousin. Uh, there's only one doorman you can talk to if things break. Um, you know, and it became clear that it was an illegal sublet. And so he began thinking, how will I feel every single day walking into that lobby knowing I have a secret? What if another doorman catches my eye and something's broken and I blurt it out? What if I make a mistake? What if I look horribly guilty? You know, and he, he just realized he could not do that. As attractive as the deal was, he couldn't live every day thinking, you know, with that much separation from the people in the building. And so he turned it down. And then when he told his friends, they said, are you crazy? Everyone who lived in New York lives that way. 
you know, and so it's not like God's rule or, you know, clear harm to anybody, but you know, within that it's going to be a burden, that it's going to be confusing, that you're going to feel so apart and isolated from others, disconnected. It's just not worth it. And that's our ultimate um, kind of uh, guide, you know, about our actions. Because it's being generous to yourself or not. Good, just to, to add to that, and the thought came back this way. Oh, good. <laughs> but I caught it. <laughs> <laughs> so I think for most of us, you know, I'm assuming that most of us here do live you know, reasonably ethical lives and, you know, are committed to, you know, large extent not to harm. Um, but there's one of the precepts which I have found to be a huge area of practice and one that actually informs most of the day, every day. So it's an opportunity to bring mindfulness and awareness and generosity in the way we've been talking about it, to integrate it right into our practice, into our lives. And that is the whole arena of right speech. We talk a lot. But how often are we really paying attention to what and how we're saying? You know, and so again, the general framework, you know, don't lie. Probably we're mostly pretty good at it, you know, but it would, might be worth refining, you know, so when we find ourselves about to say something that's not quite true, if it's in our minds, no, this is, this is harmful. It's harmful to the other person. It's harmful to me is in the way that Sharon was just saying. But my favorite, my very favorite, practice of right speech is kind of in the classical text described as refraining from useless talk. And there's a word in the Pali language, which is closely related to Sanskrit. It's the ancient language uh, the Buddhist teachings were originally offered in. So the Pali word for useless talk I think this is my favorite word in the world. Sampapalapa. <laughs> it sounds just like what it is. <laughs> Sampapalapa. You know, and I just notice in myself and, you know, with many others, we can just be hanging out. It's not, we're just hanging out with friends and not doing anything special. And so often I'll see the tendency in my mind just to say something that is totally useless. It doesn't contribute anything to anyone except to announce, here I am. You know, that, that, that's basic, the, the energy behind Sampapalapa. It is really frequent. And so I have found it just incredibly interesting to keep an eye out for that impulse. And then when I catch it, no, nah, I don't have to say that. And then as Sharon just said, to notice the difference in how I feel when I refrain from saying it and when I just blurt it out. And there's an amazing difference. When I can see the impulse and say, no, I don't have to do that. There it is. There's a feeling of kind of inner strength, a conservation of our energy. We're not just, we're not just, you know, spilling our energy out. And it is a gift to others because basically we're not wasting their time with our useless talk. So this is, it's a little big thing, right? It's just, it, it's not, it's not some big dramatic lie or anything like that. It's just, it's just a, tendency we have, but if we can pay attention to it and work with it, it actually enhances our well-being. 